Hey, um, by now, most, if not all of you, will have heard about the case in Israel in which a married Arab man was convicted of rape by deception because, it is said, he lied to a Jewish woman in order to get her to have sex with him. Much, really most, of the reporting, blogging, and videos I've seen about this case have, at least, expressed incredulity as regards the proposition that one can be guilty of rape because one lied in order to have sex. Uh, there are also concerns about this conviction being the result of anti-Arab, anti-Muslim bigotry, as well as sexist and paternalistic assumptions on the part of the Israeli legal system in particular, and the Israelis in general. Uh, while I have no trouble believing that anti-Arab bigotry and sexism were factors contributing to the Israeli verdict, as Susan Estrich of the University of Southern California Law School in Los Angeles correctly observed in her 1986 article in the Yale Law Journal entitled Rape, still one of the best uh, scholarly articles I've ever read about rape, quote, the history of rape as the law has been enforced, is a history of both racism and sexism. The concept of rape by fraud or deception is not uniquely Israeli. Uh, for example, some American states have rape by fraud laws, and even Jewish Israelis have been convicted of rape by deception. I'd like to spend a few minutes examining the concept of rape by fraud or deception and make some suggestions as to how we might think about it. It seems safe to say that when most of us think of rape, we think of it in terms of a crime involving sex, force, and a lack of consent. And indeed, this is how it has traditionally and primarily been defined. Engaging in sexual intercourse by forcible compulsion, the force can be actual or threatened, against the will or without the consent of the other person. Perpetrator's use or threat of force is, among other things, um, evidence of the victim's lack of real consent. Now, while this is how rape is primarily defined, it's not an exhaustive definition. For example, here in New York State, the criminal law divides rape into three degrees. Uh, rape in the first degree includes sexual intercourse by forcible con uh, compulsion, as well as sexual intercourse with a person, quote, incapable of consent by reason of being physically helpless. Uh, the statute defines that as, quote, a person who is unconscious or for any other reason is physically unable to communicate unwillingness. And sexual intercourse with minors of various ages, examples of statutory rape, uh, that is, sexual intercourse with a person below a statutorily defined age. If the details of rape in the second and third degrees in New York interest you, there's a link to the relevant section of the state's penal law in the description box. In addition to force, consent, and age, uh, the law as it pertains to rape has also been concerned about, as the model penal code puts it, quote, intimacy achieved by certain fundamental kinds of deception. Now, these cases are tough because they don't involve any force or threat thereof, and it appears the sexual intercourse is consensual. Patricia J. Falk of the Cleveland Marshall College of Law notes in her article, Rape by Fraud and Rape by Coercion, that there is a, quote, surprisingly large body of criminal cases in which courts have struggled with the difficult question of whether to criminally punish defendants' use of fraud or coercion in accomplishing sexual penetration or contact. Um, Falk points out that this is not a recent phenomenon. Cases in the American legal system dealing with rape by fraud, coercion, or deception go back at least to the 19th century. Uh, see, for example, the 1857 decision of the Alabama Supreme Court in Lewis v. State, in which the court, quote, invites the attention of the legislature to address this. Uh, the court complained, quote, under our penal laws, one who obtains the goods of another under false and fraudulent pretenses is held guilty to the same degree as if he had feloniously stole them. He who contaminates female purity under like fraudulent pretenses, however, goes unwhipped of justice. Nearly 130 years later in her article Rape, uh, Susan Estrich, who probably has little 
if anything, in common with the members of the 1857 Alabama Supreme Court, uh, complained about the very same thing, decrying, quote, deception and false pretenses as methods of seduction, and the law's general inattention with respect to them. Estrich contended, quote, the law should be understood to prohibit claims and threats to secure sex that would be prohibited by extortion law and fraud or false pretenses law as a means to secure money. It would be a significant improvement if the law of rape in any American state prohibited exactly the same deceptions as that state's law of false pretenses or fraud. Just to get a sense of how this might work, let's look at the elements of larceny by false pretenses in Massachusetts law. Five things must be proven beyond a reasonable doubt to sustain a conviction. One, that the defendant made a false statement of fact. Two, that the defendant knew or believed that the statement was false when he or she made it. Three, that the defendant made the statement with the intent that the person to whom it was made should rely on it as true. Four, that such person did in fact rely on defendant's statement as true. And five, that such person parted with personal property as a result. Now, apply this to rape. Numbers one through four would remain the same. It would be number five that would change, um, that such person consented to sexual intercourse as a result. A number of states have agreed that people's bodily integrity and sexual autonomy deserve at least as much protection as the law gives people's money or property against being taken by fraud and deception. Uh, see, for example, Tennessee. Its criminal code's definition of rape includes, quote, sexual penetration accomplished by fraud. In the 1999 case, State of Tennessee v. Mitchell, Tennessee's Court of Criminal Appeals noted that in the statute, fraud, quote, includes, but is not limited to, deceit, trickery, misrepresentation, and subterfuge, and shall be broadly construed to accomplish, it, uh, to accomplish the purposes of the statute. The idea is that when consent to sexual intercourse is obtained by deceit, trickery, misrepresentation, and the like, then, at the very least, it's not legally significant consent. More to the point, it's not consent at all. In the Mitchell case, the defendant called young women in the Nashville area and pretended to be their boyfriends or fiancés. Once he fooled a woman as to his identity, he tell her he had a sexual fantasy about having sex with her while she was blindfolded. Now, he managed to get some women to agree to wait for him in their homes or hotel rooms with a blindfold on and have sex with him. Uh, now, one could argue that the sex in these cases was consensual, but was it? These women didn't consent to having sex with Mr. Mitchell. Rather, they consented to having sex with their boyfriends or fiancés. Should they have known better? Perhaps. Should the victims of fraudulent scams and the crime of false pretenses have known better? Perhaps. Does that keep us from prosecuting the perpetrators of fraudulent scams and the crime of false pretenses? No. Why, if at all, should it be different when fraud is used to obtain sex? One of the chief reasons many people are alarmed by the concept of rape by fraud or deception is that we all know that to one degree or another, everyone lies for and about sex. Everyone. Uh, the lies range from padded bras, pretending to be a nice person, uh, lying about one's age, as well as false declarations of love and commitment right on through to the egregious behavior of people like Mr. Mitchell in the Tennessee case, and worse. Uh, where exactly should the line be drawn between fraud or deceptions that render sexual intercourse criminal and fraud or deceptions that, as a Canadian Supreme Court justice once put it, quote, however sad, have been left to the domain of song, verse, and social censure, as opposed to the criminal law. That, of course, is the tough question here. However, 
It seems to me that Susan Estrich got it right back in 1986. Bodily integrity and sexual autonomy deserve at least as much protection against fraud and deception as our money and property get. Don't you agree?